few minutes for um, people to join us. So, as you may be aware, uh, UNHCR with its partners including CALP, WFP, OCHA, Oxfam Save the Children and DRC have uh, developed a toolkit, an operational guidance and toolkit for multipurpose cash grants that was released in January 2016. Um, and this toolkit is really a, a, a starting point and a very uh, interesting document to uh, conceptualize and, and think through the concept of uh, multipurpose cash grants, with which, as you know, is um, uh, now being more and more trendy and interesting for the community of practice without always knowing how to own it and how applicable it can be uh, in other regions, especially as um, experience that inspired this uh, toolkit is really uh, focusing on the Middle East crisis. So the interest we had was to try to see how this concept of MPG and multipurpose cash grant could be applicable and relevant for other contexts or other regions, including, of course, West Africa. So the purpose of this webinar is to share good practice and lessons identified from UNHR multisectoral CTP in Niger. So the case study has been developed by Muriel Kalo and Flor Grotenus. So Flor is uh, with us today and she would be presenting the learnings of uh, that case study just when I'm finished with the introduction word. Uh, Robert Ayn is the Associate Targeting Officer from the UNHCR team in Nigeria. He's with us also today and he will be able to answer your questions in the Q&A session regarding the project itself. He's supported by Rika Mikola, she's the Regional Cash Expert from UNHCR Regional Office in Dakar. Um, so the case study um, is um, just finalized and it will be available on CALP web website right after the, the webinar. So we will share also the link to that case study along with the recording of this webinar. Uh, if not this afternoon, then uh, tomorrow probably. So um, the objective that CALP had in developing that case study was to document for the first time in West Africa, the practices of multi-sectoral cash transfer programming, um, not as understood in the toolkit because we soon realized that it was not really MPG that were implemented in the region, but trying to capture what were the principles behind MPGs that were already being implemented through multi-sectoral cash transfer programming in the, in the region. So these distinctions between um, multi-sectoral cash and multi-purpose cash is very tiny and sometimes not easy to catch. So the case study also tried to um, um, help practitioners understand how could be the evolution between multi-sectoral and multi-purpose cash um, the purpose of this webinar is not really to give you an induction of, on MPG or to establish clear distinction or definition of neither of these concepts, uh, but better to highlight the suitability of the tool and to identify the gaps in terms of tool and expertise to actually implement MPG in West Africa. Um, so, I already presented the panel, I will uh, just give you a word on how the webinar will be organized. So, after this short introduction, I will um, let uh, Floor present the key learnings, good practices and recommendations from the case study. Then we will have a Q&A session that we hope could be uh, 45 minutes long. And um, you will be asked to type your questions in the chat box that you see normally on your right. Uh, so I will read out loud your questions and um, uh, give the word to either Robert or Floor to uh, provide response and maybe me if I can help, of course. Uh, so this webinar is recorded and as I said before, we will be sharing the link. Uh, there is also, after this webinar, a regional cash working group meeting organized in Dakar 
in West Africa on the 19th of September that will be also dedicated to a multi-purpose cash grant. So the idea for us is to develop a kind of um, like to do a kind of learning path on, on MPG, starting with this case study, the webinar, and trying to, to move forward the idea and the consideration of MPG, trying to see what are the obstacles, uh, is it first relevant for the region, and how CALP can better support the organizations in considering this, if it's a suitable option, and what are the tools and expertise that are missing to probably implement them. Um, I think that's it for the introduction. So without taking much time, I will let Floor start with the presentation. So the webinar will normally last 90 minutes. Um, and so, yes, Floor, uh, up to you to, to start. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, it's really my pleasure to present um, this case study. And just to clarify, this case study was not just developed by me and Muriel, but it was very much developed by the team and the participants uh, at different levels within UNHCR who have been involved in Mangeze uh, in the refugee camp. Um, so thank you all. This is also your work very much. Um, Trying to move to the next screen, sorry. This is new technology for me, bear with me. <laughs> okay, there we go. So I wanted to give you um, an overview of the MPG toolkit framework just for your idea of this is a the toolkit that was developed by uh, UNHCR with CALP and Oxfam, Save the Children, uh, Danish Refugee Council, and um, Natalie already spoke about it, so I'm not going to go into it in much um, detail, but I wanted to just give you an overview of how practical this toolkit is and the different steps to take um, to set up an, a multi-purpose grant. Um, and uh, I think it's a very useful tool uh, for anybody who's considering it. And um, so these are the different stages of uh, thinking through your multi-purpose grant, um, which is no different to any of the stages in general program design. Um, uh, is that it's in response to the crisis in Mali in 2011 and was established in Tel Aviv region. Uh, and the first wave of refugees came in February, and then very quickly after, you know, in May, the camp was established. And um, as of today, the camp uh, has 8,786 people. This figure does change a little bit, but that's approximately, you know, the, the amount as people move in and out. And um, even still now, the prospects for return are limited, um, and there's particularly with the focus on DIFA and other humanitarian crises, the funding for Mangeza has diminished. And this is an important factor in sort of the decision making of the team to look for alternative ways to best support refugees. And this happened alongside the food vouchers that UNHCR, together with World Food Program, implemented and started implementing in April 2013. Um, and was received very well by the refugees. Um, and simultaneously, UNHCR is involved in many different sectors. It is also starting to uh, facilitate um, voluntary return to uh, Mali for those who felt safe to go back, which is also in the form of a transfer. Um, but also, there were quite a few Nigerian um, who, who were living in Mali and who fled with the Malians. And uh, UNHCR negotiated uh, together with the social safety net program of Niger nationally to see if they could be integrated in their social safety net program. And that really was an important moment because it was the start of a relationship between UNHCR and the social safety net at national level in Niger. Um, so there's a couple of things that are going on at the same time that leads for, to UNHCR to do more and more different cash projects within Mangeze uh, refugee camp to support the refugees for their different needs. 
And as um, I want to give you an overview of those different projects and their objectives, and also to sort of demystify this idea of a multi-purpose grant, um, that actually it's a very natural thing to move to after you are supporting the same beneficiaries for different sectoral needs with by through giving them money. Um, and it makes then a lot of sense to bring that into one grant, which would be a multi-purpose grant, which they are free to choose on how to spend. When we speak about multi-sectoral, we're looking at grants that are specific to the sector and that are only implemented through that sector and doesn't combine any other needs that, that people are having. So the overview in Manguez is there are food vouchers of which the objective was very much to provide in people's food needs. And these are a voucher program. Um, and then uh, actually UNHCR moved to looking at the NFIs, which were problematic to deliver. Um, they weren't coming on time. Refugees were complaining about the quality of the non-food items. Pots were melting on the fire. And they did a lot of consultation with refugees on how they could support them better and suggested if they would give them cash how that would feel. They also combined different needs within the NFI grant. Um, so not just uh, non-food items, but also shelter materials were included in this NFI grant, which is why it's called the NFI Plus um, in this report. And then very much, you know, at the overarching objective of UNHCR is support refugees to become as independent as soon as possible. Um, and uh, the livelihood grant was designed to really give um, households an impetus to start um, regenerating their activities and investing in their small scale businesses or in other sources of income that they have through, the, um, through a livelihood grant. Um, there was a catch to this grant, or there is a catch, is that it meant that refugees had to sign a contract. And this was, you know, they could choose whether they wanted to or not. They signed a contract to um, say that after, after uh, two years, they, or after 18 months, they would not um, ask UNHCR for any more support, other than the support that is already um, is part of being in the camp but um, any other support is in terms of livelihood needs. Um, so those are the sort of the overview of different things happening at the same time. And just like, you know, our lives, refugees' lives have so many different <laughs> components that need support. Um, and therefore, it's sort of a, a natural step to move from bringing in small sectors together to maybe at some point developing a real multi purpose grant, which includes everything in one delivery. Um, so I've kind of gone through this, but these are some key concepts in um, multi-purpose grants and throughout the toolkit. And one of the important characteristics of a multi-purpose grant is that um, it includes a minimum expenditure basket. And it's something that defines all of the household's needs and um, over time. And so it's not only looking at food needs or non-food items or health or education, but it's, it's looking at everything together. And based on that, a grant, an amount is chosen um, to deliver. And some of the really good practices in, in, um, with that UNHCR did without having actually a lot of input from the toolkit, because they developed this while the toolkit was in development is that they um, did a rapid assessment um, to look at the needs um, across the different sectors. Uh, they did do market analysis that were available either through WFP and other partners, um, and they looked at the different risks, um, the security and protection, and then they grouped the different needs together, like as I explained in the NFI Plus grant. In terms of design and targeting, um, the livelihood grant really was a blanket targeting except by choice if you felt you couldn't, um, if you couldn't sign the contract. But the NFI Plus was a blanket targeting, the food vouchers were blanket targeting. Um, but the way that they chose to, um, uh, to enumerate and the value of the grant was very much related to what the um, 
social safety net uh, agency in Niger was paying um, to vulnerable households um, as a long-term program and also related to minimum wage levels um, in Niger. Uh, and this is an important consideration because if you would add up all the needs together, even just the cost of food needs plus the cost of non-food items and shelter, you would come to a much higher amount per month per household than what UNHCR actually delivered. They streamlined it with the local, um, the local uh, practices uh, at government level. And this is, I think, an important issue because on the one hand you could say you would like to negotiate for the refugees actually need a bit more money than what they're given but at the same time you don't want to create tensions between refugees and host population and even at government level because as a refugee you have a specific status than as someone who's from Mali. Um, the grant was chosen to be delivered in cash uh, through a local um, financial provider, ASUSU, and ASUSU was selected independently by UNHCR through an official tender process. Um, ASUSU is one of these financial service providers in Niger that is doing a lot of the cash-based programming for other agencies um, and other CALP uh, member agencies. Um, and WFP has done an extensive assessment of different service providers and there's quite a, you know, a range of people to choose from um, and it's interesting that UNHCR came to the same conclusion that ASUSU was useful um, though you know, there are other problems with ASUSU that they have been unreliable and so it is important within the community to understand which service provider is going to be the most supportive for you. Uh, general standard operating, standard operating procedures were developed for the camp explaining how things would deliver and everybody was on board with that and this is a good practice that is um, in general any cash program um, as well as a multi-sector grant. And what's, what I think is the key to success of this project um, is really that the senior management um, within UNHCR and the relationship between UNHCR at senior level and WFP allowed these, uh, this project to happen. It's a relatively small number of beneficiaries for UNHCR and World Food Program and they're willing to sort of think together and, and pilot some ideas of how to support refugees better. So the, the, the personalities involved in setting up this grant were sort of key to sort of circumventing what would be um, you know, challenges within an organization where managers feel unsafe to take a risk of something they're not sure of how, to, the how it comes together. Um, so this is really a key factor to enabling UNHCR to implement this as a pilot in Mangeza and now actually learn from it and see how it could be appropriate in other areas. Um, so and also what UNHCR did was to bring in external expertise to support them in the design um, of the different stages and of the different types of grants uh, within um, Mangeze. When we looked at program quality and impact, um, specifically starting with protection, protection risks um, were identified, however it was not so clear how they were linked to the program and how they were actually integrated into the design and delivery. Um, there have been no reports of increased tensions or internal household conflict because of the transfers. Um, we also spoke to the host community and they didn't mention any I, things of jealousy or feeling of unfair. So it, it shows that there's a relatively good relationship between all the different parties that are living together around the Mangeze camp. One thing that was really problematic is that people felt quite insecure with their cash, even though they very much wanted cash and had asked for cash, um, because it's still an insecure area, there's uh, bandits around, and they felt the need to spend their money fast um, uh, rather than keep it um, for fear of being robbed. Um, and I think this is an important point that will come back uh, further on in the presentation. In terms of accountability and feedback and communications, I mean, UNHCR has a sort of thorough system of sensitizing refugees, consulting with leaders and consulting with uh, representatives um, within Mangeze camp and um, people we spoke to were very much aware of the different parts. Um, and there's 
real accountability and feedback mechanisms in place through the refugee committees. Um, and also thinking ahead, uh, because the exit sort of vision um, for Mangeza, as much as we all know that many refugee camps uh, stay around for many, many years, I, I can see that in UN, UNHCR Niger is very much looking at how to to really support the Malian refugees to become independent and spends a lot of time negotiating with Nigerian uh, the authorities in Niger to secure land for refugees, to look at the legal aspects of employment for them, um, and to really uh, support them to become uh, yeah, independent economic actors within the status that they inhabit. And um, it's commendable. We look at the impact of the grant. I, the grant really supported families to prioritize their needs and to have free choice on how they would spend their money and it was d in different ways and to increase the ability for them to support themselves. And you can see in Mangeza people are busy and active with their lives, specifically women. Um, uh, women are very much empowered through these grants. Um, and um, what was a little unclear, because this case study looked specifically at UNHCR's activities and didn't look at the other agencies uh, working within the camp. Um, and some of the households had received some livelihood-related training, others hadn't. Um, and that would be sort of on a technical livelihood level, something to look at to see how refugees could best use their uh, livelihood grants to really set up that business and become independent. If we look at the market aspect, um, there was a huge expansion of sales and trade. Now, Mangeze Camp is unusually located next to a very active regional market, which has a big livestock market, big grain market, and that has always been there. Um, so the market access is, is obviously there, and it's been very clear that through the presence of the refugees and through the input of cash into the system, um, the market has expanded in, in many ways um, and it's increased the availability in products of quality as well as the competition of prices. Um, and the way that the voucher works is slightly different because the voucher, WFP, works with specific traders that is identified to take the vouchers. And so initially it was only a few traders that are benefiting from this voucher and a sort of create a monopoly within the market, but WFP is slowly breaking through that by encouraging other traders to be um, also accept vouchers. Um, and it is clear that there's a price surge at the market while there's distributions of cash. Um, but the specifics of that are not um, documented. Looking sp at impact, um, we asked uh, the young boys and girls to think about what difference the grant made in their lives, to get another point of view of what they're seeing that has been made possible through these different cash programs, these different sexual cash programs. And these pictures that you see are an overview of some of the pictures that the different boys and girls took of, of, of their surroundings and of, uh, to explain the impact that these grants had. And it's interesting to note that the boys focus very much on the outside part, on shelters and on the lights and on the livestock outside, where the girls were looking very much at what's happening in the household and the different buckets and non-food items and the shops that they could set up that they're helping with um, and the materials that they could buy for the sewing machine. Um, and um, it was a very unique way to get an insight into how the youth within a camp perceive the impact of these grants. Um, but that's a different presentation on its, on its own. I just wanted to share some of these pictures with you. Looking at preparedness and coordination in Niger, um, the Disaster Preparedness Agency is the main framework. And um, this is the, would then be a key partner. Um, and it's, in terms of preparedness, we, it wasn't very clear how this could happen, and it really seems to be a bit of a, bit of a gap, um, that there's a need for you know, strategic and technical coordination and the, around the full range of humanitarian actors to really agree on common tools and methods so that 
we can support refugees collectively or or um, communities in need or displaced affected communities to become independent um, as soon as they can and that the local level technical and operational coordination across common actors is really important and, and UNHCR and WFP and CARE are coordinated but there's so many more actors within Niger doing similar things that it feels that there's a lot more information and experience that, is, that you can capitalize on and start preparing for given the different flows of refugees that are, that are coming into Niger right now. Um, there is a sort of coordination um, at ECHO level which uh, many of these agencies who are receiving ECHO funding are coordinating together um, how, and doing cash programs but this is not a cash program and coordination group um, and there was a cash working group but it's actually been inactive since 2014 and now through you know through DIFA and through uh, I think the toolkit and other activities happening there's a sort of resurgence to recreate the coordination of the cash working group um, but it's interesting that there is Little, been little consultation and learning um, pulled from you at, by UNHCR to inform, you know, how how best to design the Mangeze intervention. And one of those key areas is really the um, looking into the aspect of delivery um, and 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 you know the refugees were very clear that they wanted cash, but they were also afraid that they were being um, they were going to be robbed of their cash. So piloting ideas of mobile money and sort of more electronic methods, which do exist in Niger, but people are just not very well informed of it, um, that that would, would be an important avenue to explore. So some of the recommendations which come from the toolkit that um, Yura and I sort of felt um, are valid here is to really look better at the in-house capacity of cash programming so within UNHCR and then look at how to build on that as you are developing these multi-sectoral grants or potentially in the next step moving to multi-purpose grants and then within conducting more focused assessments where you're actually looking at defining a minimum expenditure basket and conducting you know a, a market assessment that covers all the different areas that the needs um, are reflected and look at what which markets can actually meet those needs. There was an issue with the shelter uh, materials that actually the market did not have the shelter materials that refugees wanted to buy. Um, and so that would be an element to think of, you know, how could the market actually start providing that or would this then be a part of the grant that is given in kind and that UNHCR procure that, but that then makes the efficiency of supporting so many refugees much smaller and to really explore how you could group all the needs into one transfer uh, through the first initial assessments. Um, design and targeting and UNHCR together with WFP is working on the new s sets of targeting methods um, but it's really important to not just look at food needs but to also do a sort of holistic socio-economic situation of including households access to health and education and identifying people with specific needs and risks and being able to refer them so that they can get support. Gender analysis was sort of absent in this though men and women are consulted separately and um, asked for feedback separately it feels that that's still an area of improvement to, to look at how women and men could be supported and this may be more towards the men's side if you look at the women were extremely active and women complained that some of the men were inactive maybe it's also around looking well what would support men to be more active for their households um, so to move away from this idea of gender being only about women but being about the interrelationships and what this grant would make possible for them if we're looking at delivery and implementation is to really understand better safe and reliable local options before choosing a modality and perhaps building in space to also adjust the modality because the direct delivery of cash um, is providing a security risk for people even if it's just perceived. There have been no incidents of security but people feel insecure. 
Um, so we're looking really to investigate, as I mentioned before, mobile money and other e-transfer options. And then the coordination, which I touched on earlier, is, is essential. And I think that there's so much experience in Niger that can be pulled together by different agencies and you can really learn from each other um, on looking at how to target populations, transfer values, delivery mechanisms, and this, this could be an exciting proactive engagement and particularly if you're looking at defining what a, multi, uh, a minimum expenditure basket is, how does that fit in with the social safety nets? How does that fit in with the minimum wage? Is it fair? Is it right? Should the minimum wage actually be adjusted to be more? Uh, you know, looking at these sort of national advocacy options that may be a way to even support communities better. Um, and there are some obvious partnerships between uh, UNHCR, CALP, and WFP um, to really invigorate the cash coordination and share experiences and resources through a common forum like CALP, like what we are doing now, um, which is great. Um, if we're looking at monitoring and learning, I think there's a general gap in my experience of humanitarian programs that when you're learning, that the learning is we talk about lessons, but they're actually not implemented into a program cycle and the programs aren't adjusted. And, and this is important because I think in Mangeza, exploring whether to adjust for the tarpaulins or whether to adjust for the delivery mechanisms of cash um, are important moments as a team to see what, what's possible. Also to look at the price monitoring um, and not just for food and, and basic commodities, but also for other needs that are defined in a um, minimum expenditure basket and alert um, and prepare market actors for changes in demand that okay we are going to implement this program refugees are going to get money they're going to need a lot more um, you don't have you know to support them to have enough stocks to support the need um, and then to spread out payments, however, there's also an argument that, you know, particularly if you're looking at livelihood needs and sort of longer investments, you know, refugees would want, um, or anybody receiving livelihood input would want larger amounts so that they could invest in more expensive things. So, you know, spreading payments is a way of spreading risk, but it's also may mean that they always spend the little amount of money and don't have enough money to invest in that sewing machine or to invest in that donkey cart. Then when we look, come to preparedness and um, it's really important to, again, these are the same issues, but then looking from a preparedness perspective, looking at people's needs and relationships with markets and the acceptability of cash for governments and for beneficiaries and donors and to really establish a strategically focused country level cash working group where government is involved from the onset and local working groups. I mean it makes a lot of sense in Niger to have a DIFA level working group um, and then perhaps a Mali level working group or even an urban level working group. Um, and then looking at forecasts for future refugees for uh, flows in Niger and how could multi-sector or multi-purpose cash inform preparedness uh, for activities to really position a rapid rollout and scale up? I think there's a lot of potential there that um, is easy to harness. So as an MPG, there are interagency opportunities to develop a multi-purpose grant and I think Niger is very ready to explore with different agencies to move towards a multi-purpose grant um, and unpack those different areas that I spoke of, you know, looking at targeting, monitoring, but also the identification of financial service providers and how that relates to minimum wage. And one of the things that could make it simple is that there's really a unifying overarching objective in a, between agencies or within a grant um, a multi-purpose grant where there's a common response plan and targeting criteria and a unifying overarching objective I feel is what most agencies have is to really support um, communities in need to become independent as soon as possible across the different areas that are part of their lives. And in discussions with UNHCR and WFP they're very much willing to partner um, at an interagency level uh, and thus support, you know, different implementation arrangements. 
so that's, that's where there's learning um, and there's a sort, sort of a repeat to enhance operational coordination and actually perhaps start with a multi-sector assessment and a definition of a, multi, of, of a minimum expenditure basket um, already now, you know, at a preparedness stage when you know that there are potentially going to be an influx of people and maybe that is actually an, um, an, a minimum expenditure basket might be valid nationally or are they different at different localities um, and then really to start invigorating the cash coordination and explore ways to share experiences and resources and uh, DIFA seems to be an obvious area where this could be piloted even if it's just for a specific group of people um, in Niger it makes sense to take that on and then for the wider community of practice, um, I think one of the key challenges to multi-sector and multi-purpose cash is that it needs to be demystified. It isn't that complicated. It's, it's really multi-sector is different sectors supporting the same group of beneficiaries. And then multi-purpose is an obvious next step where you're pooling all that money together into one grant, giving people this grant one time. And so there's, there are real gaps in strategic leadership and coordination around that, um, specifically as all the experiences have come from the Middle East, um, yet though the context is different in West Africa, it's, it's a relevant um, programmatic response. Um, and, and what new NHCR has shown really well how effective it is to align with national social protection systems um, also as an exit strategy and as a way to um, bring governments on board into how to support these populations. Um, and there's a real opportunity in leveraging your integrated partnerships and um, you know between financial service providers which is happening in many regions but I think West Africa is a little further behind, but it's right there with its technologies, um, which of mobile money and other e-vouchers, um, and pooling the experience of other cash actors. Um, and then really influencing key donors. I mean, I think one of the success measures for UNHCR was that they had a very flexible donor that was very excited about their pilot, um, specifically for this project, and would then also advocate to other donors to um, support the project um, in Mangeze and the pilot. And so the next step is really to pull that learning together and show, look, we can do this at a larger scale for more people and to make a bigger difference. Um, and I think it's important that donors become a little less scared of pooling this together because agencies have experience and are able to demonstrate that. So what we're learning here is that multi-sector cash is feasible in Niger, in a refugee context and beyond. Um, and I would actually add that multi-purpose, you know, a one grant for groups is very relevant. And that pilots are a really valuable way to develop agency and, you know, the collective cash working group experiences. Um, and there's, it's really valuable to recruit in ad hoc expertise to support the design and setup of in-house experiences lacking. And there's a lot of people with that experience that you can bring in. Um, and to really cultivate these flexible and supportive donor relationships to allow to take a little bit more risk um, and to foster inter-donor advocacy. And this also links to the long-term opportunities where if it's being embedded in, not embedded, but sort of coordinated with uh, national so social safety nets, you're looking at supporting these people, bridging that gap between the humanitarian and the long-term development, which has always been a challenge. And this could be that bridge, um, which many of us have been trying to build uh, over years. So thank you very much um, for listening to this um, pre uh, presentation on Mangeze um, and to UNHCR's pilot program there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Flor. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. I hope that you all enjoyed it. So we already have received uh, several questions. So um, we can start uh, already with the um, 
with the Q&A session, what I'll ask you to do is to type your questions in the chat box and I will read them out loud and ask our panelists to, to answer them. So maybe just a few words to uh, build on, on um, floor presentation. What we can uh, learn from this case study is that um, at least in this context, specific context of refugee and in Niger, um, can learn a lot from multi-sector cash transfer programming and especially that um, this particular experience uh, pushed us to go beyond and consider MPG as a relevant tool. Um, though we also can identify major challenges, especially in terms of coordination and other. So UNHCR has, demonst has demonstrated very good practices in this specific grant um, at organizational level, institutional, le institutional level, and um, they have understood this kind of big, big picture and a broad perspective in trying to address the um, um, challenges that vulnerable people and here refugees are facing. So we have had a few questions already. The first one is, uh, from Jacqueline Fries. So, how is MPG being translated in French? Uh, I think I can, I can try to answer that one. Maybe. Um, so, uh, there is no uh, actual definition, as you as mentioned in the introduction. There is no um, final concept and definition of neither multisectoral or MPG. But as CALP, um, we translate MPG as uh, transfert monétaire à usage multiple, which is TMUM as an acronym, which is not as nice as MPG. Uh, so we often keep on using MPG to translate like MPG. Um, but yeah, we had another question from Michel Dupuis on uh, getting back to one of the first slides that you shared, Flor on uh, the distinctions like what characterize really the, the MPG and trying to distinguish between multi-sector and multi-purpose. So maybe without spending much time on this concept distinction because it's, it can raise a lot of debates and no one has the final word on it. Uh, but just maybe, Flo, if you can get back to that slide and try to say a few words on how we can at least characterize really what is an MPG, how we understand, how is it conceptualized in the toolkit. Yeah, sure. Um, here we go. I think we're talking about this this slide. Um, yeah, yes. So um, a multi-purpose grant is an unrestricted cash transfer that corresponds to the amount of money that a household needs to cover fully or partially their basic and or recovery needs. So that's based on the identification of the minimum expenditure basket which defines what a household need, requires to meet recurrent needs and the average cost of those needs at that location over time because that's dependent on the markets and which of those needs the markets are able to meet and which of those needs the market is not. The multi-sector grant can be a conditional or an unconditional cash transfer that covers a range of needs um, that is specifically sectoral. So it could cover food needs or livelihood support needs, shelter needs, and these are all different grants that are implemented differently um, by different teams to the same people. So they're designed and managed in a sectoral way. That would be the main distinction between the two. Where also the key thing for a multi-purpose grant is that it's unrestricted. That when beneficiaries are receiving that, they are free to spend that in the way that they see best. Does that... I'm simply just re iterating the, the definitions um, and I think in the case of UNHCR it was very clear that there was you know a non-food item plus shelter grant that was given um, out to all the households and then there was this other grant that was a livelihood uh, grant with the livelihood purpose um, that was given to those households that opted to sign the livelihood contract 
And then there were the, the vouchers for food. So those were all operationally separate grants. They were not always delivered on the same day. They were all delivered through ASUSU, but they weren't delivered as one. So you as a household would have to stand in line three times for those three different support needs. Thank you, Flor. I think I think it clarifies. Maybe because we didn't want to take much time on it, we we went fast at the first time. But I think it helps a lot. So we also received um, a few questions prior to the prior to the webinar from Atwar Rahman from Oxfam, Bangladesh. I'm not sure if he's with us today. So he asked um, three interesting questions. What are the objectives of a multi-sector cash transfer programming? Why and when would it be introduced? And do we have any examples of successes, or what are the successes of MPG? No, sorry, multi-sectoral cash transfer programming. Maybe, Floor, you can answer. Sorry, I, I lost the last part to what you said. Could you repeat? Yeah, sorry. The last question was, um, what do we have any uh, examples or documentation of the successes? What are the successes of multi-sectoral cash transfer programming? Okay, and which did you want me to answer? Um, maybe the the three, like broadly speaking, when we speak about multi-sectoral cash transfer programming. So, I think what. Uh, at where I'm trying to figure out is because we now have only one grant covering different sectors, so how do we define what could be the objective that um, uh, calls for an MPG? Um, and do we have identified or through the toolkit, is there identify any appropriate timing or particular assessment that helps defining when we should use multisectoral cash transfer programming? Well, I, as I understand it, um, this is something that is, you know, location specific, and the same criteria um, to any cash program uh, would apply in terms of the availability of markets and the the ability of these markets to meet the different needs. So you would need to identify the needs of that the group of people that you're looking at potentially giving a multi-purpose grant. Um, and pooling those needs into one grant. I think he asked about a multi-sector grant, and I think actually, you know, the example of Mangueses is very successful. It's had a huge impact. It's covered different needs um, of people uh, together. Um, and, you know, then we can also look at the Middle East, um, which I think, Natalie, you have more detailed experience on how that worked uh, than, than I do. Um, but looking at that I've mentioned a couple of times that the sort of overarching objective of these of a multi-purpose grant could be defined, you know, case by case. But what I what I noticed in Niger, and it was very clear that all of these sectors wanted to support households to become independent. Sure, I think I think it's uh, it. I hope at least it replies to uh, at our uh, questions. I think, of course, when you have a multi-sectoral CTP and objective, you have to um, have a broader objective and not a specific uh, sector-specific objective. Robert, uh, maybe you want to jump in um, and like in um, a hypothesis future. If we'd had to transform the current multi-sectoral cash transfer programming from UNHCR to an MPG, what would be to you, what could be to you the objective of such an MPG? Well, thank you, Natalie. So, in fact, uh, in Niger, as UNHCR, we are actually working towards the um, self-sufficiency of refugees, and we think that um, the introduction of cash in Mangeze has been a pilot for us to see how we actually can streamline cash more and more in our operations in order to give uh, our beneficiaries the possibility to actually decide for themselves. Because what's happening very often is that uh, refugees kind of do not um, fully appreciate in-kind assistance 
that they get because it kind of does not cover their needs. So for us, actually, there are, there are two reasons. One is the benefit for refugees themselves or for the beneficiaries themselves to actually make their own decisions. But the second is also uh, an efficiency gain for us for the operation. And as Flora said earlier, uh, there are the resources are shrinking, particularly for uh, the Madian caseload here in Niger, which is the worm, which is one of the camps that Mangeza actually uh, they are hosting Madian refugees. So uh, for us, it would be it's it's really interesting to see how we can actually improve, how we can kind of hit two birds with one stone by introducing cash and by combining different programs of cash into just one multi-purpose grant. Thank you very much, Robert. So, because we have a lot of uh, questions being asked by participants, I, I suggest that we move on to the next question. So, Jakuba Aruna, um, he asked us about the calculation of the amounts. And the amount of the cash transfer is based on the food basket, or is it the level of economic life evaluation for the cash grant? Um, I don't know either. Uh, Maybe Floor, you can start, and Robert will uh, complete if needed. How was the? Can you give us more detail on how the amount was calculated, please? Yeah, well, the amount for the food voucher was uh, calculated by WFP based on um, minimum food needs and the market prices, and that also included agreement with traders on. Um, uh, seasonal prices that would stay the same so that when households would go to exchange their voucher they would be able to receive the same amount of food for the voucher. Um, so I'm just pulling up the slide to show you the different amounts for the different grants. Um, the NFI Plus grant was um, calculated based on the um, amount that was given to uh, for social safety net households um, and um, was also adjusted based on the budget available. Um, it was not based on a multi uh, a minimum expenditure basket um, but much more coordinated with um, aid levels at national you know aid support at national level um, and this is the same for the livelihood grant. Um, they're, they're similar amounts. Um, and then the other cash amounts are one-off and I think it's not relevant for the multi-purpose grant as you see on these screens, but it was just to show the different types of cash that a UNHCR does. Uh, Robert, would you like to add to that? Did you all hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, Flo, we can okay. hear you. There is a little delay with uh, Robert, I think. Ah, uh, of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add actually to what Flo just said. So for us, it was really important to have the uh, the NFI grant to be indexed to uh, the assistance that the social safety net of Niger actually is giving. Uh, to their beneficiaries, and their beneficiaries are defined as uh, the most uh, vulnerable households in the most, I think, the most food insecure areas of the country. So they on, they are only focusing on the on the very 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 poor, and they also do not have actually much more than these ten thousand uh, uh, FCFA per month. Uh, for the duration of 12 months, and then uh, they reassess the household's um, uh, the household's economic situation. And uh, uh, for us, that uh, it would have produced or it could have produced protection risks actually if we had gone over this, because that would uh, there is very often already a certain uh, notion that refugees are. Being better served by um, by just by the mere fact that they are refugees, um, so we did not want to exacerbate that that notion even within the population. But what is very very important to pull out here, I guess for uh, for me, and that that's something that Flora actually uh, brought out in the case study as well, 
is the positive impact of uh, giving cash to refugees in order to fuel it back into the local economy. And that is something that uh, we forget uh, very often, I think, is that there is there are direct beneficiaries, which are the refugees, and then there are also indirect beneficiaries. And in this, in, in the case of Mangeza, actually, the indirect beneficiaries are the local traders, is the local uh, livestock market, for example, because um, the butcher does not have to get his meat uh, three times a week and then has to store it somewhere, but they can actually go to the refugee, uh, to the refugee community and ask and, and buy their produce from them. So we actually see also a positive impact and a positive flow back not only into the camp, but also out of the camp. Thank you very much, uh, Robert and Flor. So indeed, we always have the theoretical calculation of the amount and then the constraint budgetary and uh, and yeah, locally and so on. So that is that is it, this example in particular is very interesting. And one of the challenge that Flor has raised also for the region in West Africa and probably in other regions is how now we can support the coordination of actors to work on the definition of this MEB, how maybe cash working groups could uh, be part of it and support that, and how to liage with the social safety nets um, amount and making sure that there is coherence um, among everything. So we have a comment from Yakuba Huna for the regarding the safety net and what we were mentioning before about um, how cash can enhance resilience of population. So he is saying that filet um, sociaux, la cellule des filets sociaux in Nigeria is um, is giving cash, but it's also followed by some key trainings to make a good uh, use and efficient use of the cash that is transferred and um, allow beneficiaries to invest together and make sure that um, they invest in economic assets and um, enhancing in doing so the impact of the cash that is transferred. Um, we have a question from Samuel Maliamungu. So he's working for Oxfam in South Sudan. Um, considering the South Sudan context, where there is very weak infrastructural, institutional, including finance services, and lack of financial literacy skills among population affected by crises in remote areas, how practical can MPG be applicable and maybe in a remote framework for MPG programming considering Niger practical example? So, Floor, I don't know if you're familiar with the South Sudan context, but maybe broadly speaking, in context where infrastructures and facilities are very weak, do you see um, any learnings from this specific case? Uh, maybe for information for Samuel, the, you can give a little of background also on the context of the Manguze refugee camp and what kind of facilities and skills among the targeted populations are there. Yeah, sure. Um, I think what's also important is what uh, Mr. Yakoba explained is the uh, importance of training. So I, I want to um, dovetail from that to Samuel's question from Oxfam that one of the gaps that we felt and something that we weren't able to go in deeply was actually the whether the households were able to become independent with the money that they received from the livelihood grant and how were they supported to to do that um, and there was some training given but the partner who um, was going to be training um, hadn't done some of the training so this is this is a key a key thing I think and thank you for for raising that um, and then moving to to the context of South Sudan um, I, I think the challenge is more the coordination with at government level um, and the coordination with a social safety net, um, established social safety net system, which I sense is not as, as well set as in Niger, but the basics are still valid for any cash program is to look at what markets are available and what are markets able to, um, which needs are the local markets within the context of South Sudan that you're working, um, able to support those needs of refugees. Is it feasible that 
agencies can um, support those markets to develop somehow through um, programs and, um, and to adjust your minimum expenditure basket according to what the markets are able to provide. Um, and then, you know, you can still pool that into one grant um, or into different sectoral grants that doesn't matter, but pulling it into one grant is much more efficient um, and deals with less communication and operational costs. Um, so, so the first question is still relevant of how appropriate is cash um, in the context of where you are working in South Sudan before you even look at what that grant could look like. Thank you very much, uh, Floor. We have had a question from Annie Lowen. Unfortunately, she has left, but maybe it's, in, it's relevant for other participants. Um, maybe you partially addressed that in the presentation so already. Um, she is asking, were the grants targeted towards women? What were the gender considerations for the cash programming? Or maybe, Robert, you want to say a word specifically on protection and how you address the gender consideration in designing that grant. I'll let Robert start and I'll fill in um, where after him. Hello? About can, we can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, okay, Floor, can you start, please? <laughs> You're handing it back to me. All right. Um, it was very clear with both women and men that we spoke to that there, um, the women received the grant in general and were able to spend it, and the men were very um, agreeable to that and felt that that was correct. There was no sort of tension around who was spending that money and how the decisions were being made, which I found um, quite remarkable, actually. Um, so the, the details of that, I feel, the details of the gender uh, issues within Mangeze um, are not well documented and are something that I would encourage you know UNHCR to start looking at a little in, in more detail and to have actually integrate into the design of the program. Um, it, it was missing, but the design of the program didn't seem to cause any, on the onset, any uh, tensions and, and protection issues directly. If anything, it probably empowered women um, more. Well, uh, just to complement what Flor was saying, uh, so we actually hold uh, annually um, age gender diversity um, consultations with uh, the refugees or with refugee representatives, which is essentially focus group discussions in which they uh, can highlight what are issues with, with the grants. And uh, we have not received any, any negative feedback other than the inevitability of goods in the market. So from that side, we, there is, we, we might want to look into that uh, more, but until now, there actually has not been a protection issue um, highlighted with re with, in relation to gender. Well, there, there is one issue that did, did come up, and this was through conversations with the program director and um, the uh, country rep was that there is an increase of um, early marriages as a coping strategy where young girls are married off even earlier um, as a source of income. And so this is something that, you know, didn't come up in our discussions, but it would be something that may not even be mentioned because potentially the cultural context of what that means. And I think this is where it is really important to conduct more detailed gender um, investigation and to look at, you know, how does this work? I mean, is this an issue and is the cash uh, having an impact on that or is our program having an impact on that, uh, you know, a negative impact? Thank you very much, uh, both of you. So, um, back with Yakuba and Samuel, who are very 
Actually, thank you, both of you. So, uh, Yakuba is giving more details on um, the experience of IRC uh, in Niger and uh, explaining that for the youth refugees, they are providing, along with cash, a training in business case, and each beneficiary takes its activities under which she received the cash grant. So, this is another example of how complementary activity can really enhance the impact of cash transfer programming and and of course it's not because you're providing different like trying to um, implement an MPG or multi-sectoral cash that it it, um, it delays the interest and impact of complementary activity on the contrary uh, cash is not um, yeah it should be complemented by uh, complementary activity yeah so uh, Samuel is also giving more uh, detailed information on South Sudan. So back on what Flo was saying, um, we really much encourage all of you to lead proper assessments on your specific context because we cannot say like that just because it works specifically with UNHR and in Nigeria for a refugee context that it could work in any country of West Africa or it could work in any kind of refugee context or so on. So, just as Flo said before, when you do a CTP, whereas it is a, a single CTP, uh, um, multi-sectoral or MPG, you always have to do uh, some specific assessments to make sure this is feasible and relevant. Um, we have Justice Liku, who is uh, asking a question on coordination. So we have several questions on coordination that I will try to uh, put together. So back on how do we define the value for MPG, maybe we already answered that one regarding the MEB and trying to take into consideration uh, the broad needs from various sectors. How was the co coordination to arrive at the value like? And we have also Primina Povalon who is asking are the plans for the activation of the cash working group to ensure better coordination? So maybe I will start with that one and then uh, leave it to you, Floor, to complement on what you see on coordination and maybe uh, to Robert also to say a word on coordination on this specific case. So we are in the process of trying to revitalize the cash working group in Niger. Um, actually, WFP, OCHA, UNHCR, FAO, and many uh, NGOs that are doing cash in Niger are together working with the government trying to set up um, a cash working group that would take into consideration the various sectors um, needs in terms of cash transfer programming. We have this uh, big question about the DIFA area as uh, Flores mentioned because there are specific um, challenges and needs for multi-sector cash in DIFA. So we lead on discussions with partners in southern Nigeria to see how CALP can support the coordination process and the consideration maybe of multi-sector multi-purpose cash grants in the DIFA region and how a cash working group or any other type of coordination um, would allow uh, the creation of a space to talk about these technical issues and strategic issues on the definition of an MEB and so on. Uh, Floor and Flo first, like, would you like to compliment on that? Well, I think what's really important to note is that in, it's great that this um, uh, working group and coordination is being reactivated um, because it was really a finding that UNHCR has developed this very much mainly in partnership with World Food Program um, and with CARE, but other than that, there has not been um, much coordination, participation, or seeking of, of experiences from Niger, and yet it's clear that, you know, listening to IRC, what you've been doing, um, and also clear from other works that I've read, that there's a lot going on and a lot of experience. So there's something about coordination that people find and agencies find difficult and it would be nice to find a way where coordination is a win-win for everybody you know that it's worth the time and effort to coordinate because you're actually all going to achieve better results um, I just wanted to yeah 
to add that. There have got to be ways for it to be um, of interest. Thank you, Floor. Uh, Robert, do you want to complement what Floor just said? Hi, it's Rita, so UNHCR still. Um, I was recently in DIFA, uh, actually just last week, for the very purpose of looking at what are the possibilities for cash. It was an extremely short mission, so really um, more focus was on discussing with existing partners and actors on the ground. Um, and I think because the con context is quite challenging, and we see a lot of disruption in terms of uh, market functioning and supply chains. It is an ideal situation for comprehensive and collaborative efforts because something that will have to take place is, is, is clearly a market assessment in, in some, some quite detail. Um, for the time being, what is actually being done is, is vouchers with, um, with fares where traders are at times being brought in from 500 kilometers away. So obviously there is, is, is some potential, but for it to be really uh, successful, it should really be done, uh, I would say, by the book. Um, to my understanding, and, and I think this is yet to be confirmed, uh, there is likely to be um, a multi-actor uh, uh, preparedness and feasibility study, uh, if not end of this year, early next year, for differ for, for cash. And I would certainly say that this is something quite important. But definitely uh, due to the complexity of the situation there and, and, and the whole operational area, in that um, coordination is really, really quite important and would definitely be beneficial for all the actors. Thank you very much, uh, Rika. Very, very interesting. Um, so, we have plenty of questions. I suggest that maybe we, we stop now, sorry, with taking questions, so hopefully we'll have time to reply to everyone. Um, so, um, sorry. So, a good question from Jacqueline Frise. She's saying, UNHCR usually provides services support for local population living with close radius of refugee population. Could this approach easily be applied using MPG? So now we're talking about yeah, complementary ser services or support for hosting population. Um, Robert or Flo, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe Robert for UNHCR? Um, Robert, how are you with us? And do you want to um, reply to Jacqueline, Jacqueline's question? It's basically uh, using MPGs, does UNHCR, um, is UNHCR still able to provide support to host population? Um, I'm sorry, I think we're having some connection problems here. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, no problem. So uh, Jacqueline is asking, is saying that UNHCR usually provides support for local population living within close radius, like living close to refugee populations. Could this approach easily be applied using MPGs? Ah, that's a very good question, <laughs> which touches also on targeting, of course. So um, I can only talk to Nina here, but uh, here we're having several problems, including infrastructure problems that we think will benefit both the host community and uh, the refugee community. As opposed to cash, I think uh, longer down the line, it actually makes sense not as UNHCR to provide additional support to refugees and to the host population, 
but rather to work on the inclusion of refugees in the national systems and to support the national systems, which is what we already have been starting to do with um, the support of the Cervil Fidesisio, so with the social safety net system uh, for the Nigerian refugees, as uh, is evident on the slide uh, that is still um, on the screen, um, in order to not create a, in, uh, a parallel system. And uh, I think it's, uh, we're working towards that, and also with WFP we're in ongoing discussions how we can actually uh, start to improve uh, the, or to, to change the criteria, the, the targeting criteria for our, our common population in order to converge towards the same criteria uh, for the host population as well as for the refugee population. All while bearing in mind that refugees are, of, are naturally, um, might be at a, at a disadvantage just by the mere fact that they are displaced. I think here in Nigeria we are quite uh, fortunate that the government is very supportive of UNHCR's actions and abilities, and so I think it's. I would. We are working more towards actually strengthening the government's capacity to provide for the host population and for the refugees alike. Thank you very much, Robert. So um, because. We are now running out of time. I'm really sorry, we may not be able to cover all questions. But in any case, we will be sharing the link up to the webinar and um, we also have some additional working sessions on multipurpose culture and I'm pretty sure it's not over yet. So um, we'll find ways to answer the questions. So I will focus for the last uh, 15 minutes we have on this specific project and, and questions focusing on multisexual, multi-purpose cash grant. So rapidly, Rob, Robert, I think it's a question for you. Is there any impact assessment carried out with this program in Nigeria and what are the outcomes so far of the project? Um, so as you know, the uh, project actually is going until uh, December, or was planned to go until December, but uh, in order to cover the 18 months, it will actually also carry over into 2017 until uh, March, I think, in order for us to fulfill the contract that UNHCR also signed, of course, um, to provide 18 months of the, of the uh, cash grant for the livelihoods. So, Impact-wise, I think Floor is talking, is touching on that uh, in the case study, and uh, as I said, there have been positive impacts. There also have been have been downsides, but we have not done. Uh, we hold on to to the impact assessment until after the project has stopped. What we can see as of now is that there are people that uh, that there are beneficiaries that do benefit uh, quite a lot and that uh, identify themselves as being able uh, to provide for themselves after the end of the contract, but there is also a number of people that are not, um, that do not identify as that, that do not see them their, their capacity as strong enough to actually um, uh, achieve self-sufficiency after the end of the project. Uh, this is, as to my understanding, uh, and Floor, please compliment, um, what I'm saying. As to my understanding, this is due to uh, two factors. One is what Floor already uh, touched on, is uh, that only some beneficiaries have received livelihoods programming, which we all know is an essential part, but unfortunately in this project uh, was a little bit delayed, um, so that this has had a negative impact actually on the performance of uh, some of the beneficiaries. And the second is also that uh, some uh, beneficiaries are working in groups while others choose to work alone and we see that uh, those beneficiaries that work in groups are have a higher probability of stating that they will receive that they will achieve self-sufficiency at the end of the 18 months than those that uh, work alone so in the contract there is no stipulation that you actually have to work in groups it is a best practice but uh, the way that uh, 
some of the people uh, were working together was not sustainable uh, enough for them to carry it over or to carry them through the 18 months and then so some groups split up others uh, stayed together from the beginning to the end um, and then there are also people that split up from the original groups and now are uh, working together with family members who are receiving another grant and so that you have groups that are built on trust so these are some of the of the lessons learned or some of the uh, uh, corroborations of the lessons that have uh, that that are already established as good practices. Um, but as I said, impact assessment and uh, final evaluation only at the end of the eighteen months. Over to floor. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that just to be clear that Robert's talking specifically about the livelihood contract grant and the impact of that uh, and is not combining all the different cash responses, so the food voucher plus the NFI um, um, grant and the livelihood grant together. Um, because if you would pull those all together, that would look like a multi-purpose grant. So I think if you are going to do some sort of impact assessment, to be very clear what you're measuring impact from. Um, and I think in terms of the livelihood grant, it really, um, was problematic this this idea of groups and not being in a group it was something that was sort of trained uh, people were trained in before UNHCR was doing the livelihood grant through it was through another agency um, and you know the scope of this study was not to go into detail um, of that um, but the training element even just in basic business skills and financial skills if you're giving people money and how to bank that money and how to save that money um, which is a little bit what the um, gentleman from IRC was talking about you know tr business little business training would be something that is is refugees would even actually mention that they would like to know more about um, so, and I think it's very hard to measure impact now, as Robert says, you know, there's, there needs some more time for that. Thank you very much both. So I think this also kind of reply to Harry Fulgencio, unfortunately he's no more with us, but maybe this would help who was asking how you measure, how you, you follow up on the ground and how it has improved the condition of people. So. Um, I think we'll have to wait until the end of the project and maybe assessment that would be led then. Uh, you also had a, a comment on the slide um, distinguishing the different grants. So just to make clear for everyone, the distinction of grants is between multipurpose cash grants and multi-sector cash grants. The multi-sector market assessment is not a grant, it's an assessment that um, allow practitioners to, to see how feasible and how appropriate is the use of cash in the different sector to yeah, access to different uh, goods and services on the market. And the MEB, the minimum expenditure basket, is also the definition. It, it's a tool that helps defining the amount that is given uh, as the MPG. Uh, I think we have um, uh, a very good uh, question from um, Tony Asse from UNHCR in Dakar. Uh, so one of the main challenge for um, practitioners to own MPG is the reporting constraint and especially to donors. Um, he is asking how do you report for different budget lines such as livelihood shelter or to uh, your donors, how do you um, report on sector specific indicators, for example, when they are put into an MPG. I don't know who wants to, to, to reply to that. Maybe at uh, Flo, would you have any good practice or, I, or any comment on that? And maybe Rika, you can also say a word on that. Well, from my perspective, I think this is very much a negotiation um, at, at sort of country level within, you know, your own um, accountability and reporting systems that you start developing ways where you can cross-report on 
you know, in one report on the different sectors. And this requires, you know, advocacy between uh, agencies and donors about how can, you know, we report, do, you know, implement something like this um, and not be uh, stuck on these reporting things. I mean, if you're looking at the idea of a multi-purpose grant where you're really trusting households that they will spend the money on what they need and what it, what the needs based on their needs at that moment, that if you're doing assessments actually and understanding how they are spending that money, that those impact assessments will indicate which needs are being met and how. But to then turn that into an actual, you know, budget line, I think requires some flexibility in in how traditionally this accountability systems work and that they may need some adjustment for this kind of programming. Um, would be my first thought. Thank you very much. Well, indeed, it's always uh, tricky, and we have to all embrace that. Otherwise, it will always it's always complicated for the first ones who, who go. Uh, we have a questions also for Yanetia. How um, on the use of mobile money and the consideration of mobile money, uh, Robert? Can you tell us maybe how, if mobile money has been considered for the specific grant and do you think that it could have been helpful for example on money tracking and so on? So I'll hand over to Rika just briefly uh, to also follow up on Tony's question. Okay, yeah, so um, I, I'm going to okay. try to uh, quickly answer both the questions. For the reporting, I think that is one of the things that we realize is very also organization specific. So for UNHCR, for example, we do have a mechanism uh, to report on an MPG in our um, sort of uh, the system we use to track the way we operate and our objective, whether we meet it. And this is, I think it's something we discussed uh, during the workshop on, on sort of how organizational preparedness um, in Dakar uh, end of last year is that one of the things before we change the way we operate we need to also ensure that our mechanism that support for example reporting are in line with what we do and up to date so I think that is also extremely organization specific for UNHCR we have it for others we might not um, what comes to mobile money um, when the, the pro project uh, in Mangese was introduced in Niger it was Mobile money in Niger wasn't that available as it is already, for example, today. And for example, for UNHCR, we have just closed the tender to ensure that as we are going to expand the use of cash in uh, our operation in Niger, we actually have a very safe, sound and reliable uh, delivery mechanism. And um, yes, it, it's going to be mobile money. So it's definitely something that was already considered. We acknowledge that there are challenges with providing cash in hand. At the time, there was no other option. However, now we do have this option, and it's something that uh, the uh, operation is very actively moving towards. And we expect that right at the end of the year, we'll have a system in place. Following on that, um, also because we, we actually asked refugees how they or beneficiaries how they um, what what type of money they they prefer, and uh, they said uh, we want cash in hand. So uh, just as the as the mere fact that they trust uh, that you trust the money that you have in your in your pocket, the more the money that you have on an imaginary bank account, probably. But but uh, with the current, with the increasing instability, also in the regions where um, Mangese is located, we see that it has Okay, I'm not sure if you can still hear Robert on our side. Unfortunately, the connection with Niger is not quite poor. So um, I think we have covered almost all questions that were really specifically ta um, talking about MPG and multi-sector cash. I know that you have plenty of questions on cash transfer programming in general, but um, we will have other opportunities for uh, answering them. So just uh, mention on 
unrestricted cash transfer programming and why is there a mention of unrestricted cash transfer in the MPG definition? Um, it's by definition when you do an MPG it means that you don't restrict the use of your MPG. People can uh, of course use it on any type of good or services they want because you're covering all sectors. So you don't apply any restriction on the use of your MPG. Um, I will say a big, big thank to Robert and Rika for making yourself available for this webinar. I hope that you all enjoyed it. Um, we will send you the link to the recording that you will find available on our website. Thank you, uh, of course, to Floor for making you available for presenting this webinar and for this great case study that you produced on behalf of CALP. Uh, I wish you a very nice end of uh, afternoon. Thank you for joining and I hope to see the West African Community of Practice joining us in Dakar on the 19th to uh, continue these discussions about the MPG. Thank you everyone and goodbye. Thank you Natalie and thank you.